For the last few years, it seems like everybody is talking about having a no mow lawn or a no mow meadow. Well, having done it myself, here's everything you need to know so that you can answer the question for yourself. No mow, yes or no. Almost every garden show at this time of year will have at least one presenter talking about how they let their lawn grow long so that they have their own no mow lawn or no mow meadow. Well, it's not actually as simple as they say. So today I'm gonna to share with you all of my experiences, both good and bad, so that you can decide for yourself. And I'm not just gonna talk about practicalities, I'm also gonna talk about how it feels as well. So why did I do it? Well, I actually did it for a few reasons. The first one, if I'm totally honest, was workload. This garden is about an acre and the vast majority of that acre is covered with grass and not just grass, lawn that needs to be maintained. And I famously say in so many of these videos about how much I hate cutting grass. Even though I do hate cutting grass, I really hate, and I mean hate cutting grass. So I thought it seemed like a really good practical option that would mean that my workload during the summer when I'm already really busy, that that workload would be reduced. Then on top of that, it would be good for wildlife and biodiversity. Not only would it increase the plant species in the garden, but it would also hopefully attract and increase the number of really beneficial insects and pollinators and all sorts of other wildlife. And then finally, I was thinking aesthetics. I had an idea that to let the grass grow long would look really lovely and natural and meadow-like, and that if I kept doing a little bit of work on it through the year, that it would look almost curated. So those were the reasons why I started into the whole no mow thing last year. But now let's talk about exactly how I did it. So what exactly did I do? Well, it's very easy. I basically left all of the grass in the entire back of the garden, which to give you an idea is almost two thirds of an acre. I left that and just let it grow long. I started that back in last March when the grass started growing. And then as the season went on, I continually just mowed little paths through the garden in ways that I thought would be nice to walk and in ways that I thought would look lovely when you're either standing in the path itself or when you're looking at them from the house. And then all I did was continue to do that through the summer. And lo and behold, I got exactly that, a no mow lawn. Okay, so on to what is probably the most important part of this, which is to talk about my actual experiences of having a no mow meadow, a no mow lawn last year. And let's kick off by talking about the pros, the advantages. The first and biggest thing that I noticed was the massive boost to the biodiversity in the garden. It absolutely blew me away. I had expected that particularly in season one, when the grass grew long, it would just grow long and that would be about it. But actually in the end, there were so many other little wildflowers and plants that grew up. I couldn't believe it. There were buttercups, there were self-heal plants, which are lovely little, quite short plants with beautiful purple flowers. There were stitchworts. There were all sorts of long grasses of different types all over the garden. And as well as that, just here and there, there were even a few oxide daisies, which I was delighted about. And then to go along with that was the massive increase in insect life. There were butterflies, bees, spiders, ladybirds, you name it, they were here. And that was absolutely brilliant. In terms of looks, particularly towards the end of the spring in the early summer, it looked absolutely magical. The grass hadn't grown too tall at that stage, but there were lovely grass seed heads. There were lots of little flowers. It just looked spectacular. And particularly with the paths mown through it, these sort of winding grass paths, it just looked beautiful. I got no end of gorgeous photos and also no end of gorgeous footage that I was able to put in these videos. And then finally, the workload. At the start, I was really impressed with how low workload it actually was. All I had to do was every 
maybe a week or 10 days, run through the garden. It would only take about 45 minutes with the lawnmower, run through the garden and cut those paths again. And that was me pretty much staying on top of it. So in that sense, there are some really good advantages, but they're not all advantages. There were quite a few cons and disadvantages at the same time. So for every upside, there's a downside. And I think it's really important to talk about the downsides of going with a no-mo option, because I don't believe that gardening shows give those disadvantages sufficient airtime. And yet at the same time, those are the things that are really going to affect you personally and the things that are going to stay in your memory. The reason I went with the no-mo option was that I had seen a garden presenter say, let the grass grow long, then in August all you need to do is cut it back and your grass will bounce back. And I thought this is the perfect solution. Well, it's not quite. So for starters, you do still have to cut the grass to some degree. So if you think that you're going to get away with zero grass cutting, you need to think again. If you want to be able to move through the long grass and not get absolutely destroyed in the process, you need to be going through with a lawnmower every week or 10 days to keep grass paths mowed. Now that's not that big a deal, but there's something else that you need to do in terms of mowing, and that's hedges and edges. Now I've talked about this before, where if you look after your hedges and your edges, the rest of the garden will look neat and curated. That was something I did not do last year. I let the grass grow up, it grew through the hedges, it grew round the edges of flower beds, and in the end, it just looked really messy. Then the next thing happened, which was quite a wet and windy patch during the summer. So during spring and early summer, it looked beautiful, but then the grass continued to grow and get even taller, and that coincided with several big storms that rolled in. And wet grass ends up being very flat grass. The whole no-mow meadow basically collapsed on itself, and to walk through it ended up being really messy. It got your shoes wet, it got your trousers wet. And actually, I remember one day looking out and suddenly realizing that the garden didn't look carefree and meadow-like anymore. It looked like the garden of a derelict house. And it was at that point that I realized something needed to be done about it. So what needed to be done was it needed to be cut back. And that is no mean feat. For starters, you need to make sure that you have the right tools to be able to do it. Because I did not, and I learned through bitter experience what happens if you try and tame a no-mow meadow without the right tools. What you need to be able to do is essentially scythe it down so that you really reduce it in height before you try and reduce it further. I didn't have a scythe, I didn't even really have a strimmer, and I decided I would try and go at it with the lawnmower. Well, to say it ended up in a mess would really be an understatement. All that happened was chewed up grass, everything got gnarled up, and what I ended up doing was spending days and days fighting a losing battle. So I went out, I hired a strimmer, and I kept going. And that was okay, except you also have to be quite practiced in how to use a strimmer, and you also need to remember that when you've let your grass grow long, the crown of the grass is now a good bit higher. Yep, you guessed it. I took the grass too short in one go and basically scalped it. So what I got left with was a whole garden of very scalped, quite baldy, not very nice looking grass. Now in Ireland, we tend to have quite cool, wet autumns and winters. And what that meant was because I had scalped the grass too far, it really didn't have an awful lot of time to recover. And what set in were weeds and moss. And really at this stage, even now in late spring, where I've decided not to go with a full no-mo setup, the grass is still only just recovering in some places. Some parts are lovely, but some really aren't. They're really struggling to get back. And rather than it being something like they say on the TV, where you just cut back a little bit, actually what's happening is it's really taking a long time to get back to anything close to what would actually be a lawn. The other thing to talk about all of this work is sheer energy levels. So because this garden is so big and because I let so much of it go over to no mow, I was absolutely exhausted. At one point I spent three full days, morning to evening, working on the grass and I just drove myself into the ground. I think I actually mentioned it in a previous video where 
basically I was just absolutely flat out exhausted. So you do need to be aware that when you hit that August time, there is going to be a lot of work to really bring back the grass down to something that's controllable. And along with that is when you're bringing that grass down, you're gonna have a lot of green waste to dispose of, so be prepared. The other thing that you need to bear in mind, which may seem obvious or may not, is whether you suffer from hay fever. So different people suffer from different types of hay fever. It might be flower pollen, tree pollen, or grass pollen. I knew that I would sometimes get hay fever. Well, let me tell you something. Last year, I got mega hay fever, and it's because I have an allergy, I think, to grass pollen, and having so much long grass just meant that I spent a lot of time suffering from hay fever. So make sure that you think about that before you go full on no mow in your garden. I know that it sounds like I've just had about five minutes of being really negative about no mow, and I don't mean it to come across like that, but the negatives are really pretty big negatives if you're not prepared for them and you're not geared up to really deal with them at the time. So I suppose the big thing now is to talk about what I'm going to be doing this year. Am I going to be doing the same as last year or what? Well, the answer is no, I am not going to be doing the same thing. I'm not letting the entire back garden turn to a no mow meadow, which will then destroy me in August and probably just crush my spirit while I try and fix it. But it doesn't mean I'm going full on neat lawn either. What I'm gonna do is go for what I hope is going to be a nice middle ground. So this is one of those middle grounds. What I've decided to do is leave small patches of grass around the garden to grow long. This one is in the orchard and you can already see the benefits. There's a little celandine here with flowers. There are dandelions, which although they're weeds, they're still bringing in that increased biodiversity. And I know from last year in this area that it's not just gonna be grass. There'll be more self-heal, there'll be more stitch warts, there'll be more forget-me-nots, and it will be a nice little diverse area. Now, this area is actually quite big. It's probably about three or four meters long by about two meters wide. So that's one nice patch. And then I've also chosen some other patches around the garden where I'm just going to deliberately not mow. But the key thing is I've worked out how much I can easily deal with when it comes to August so that when it does come time to cut the grass down short, for starters, it's not going to be such a job that really just I struggle with. But also they're in areas that even if they don't look pretty great for a couple of months, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to spoil the garden. And what I believe is that although I'm not going full on no mow through the entire place, I am still getting the advantages in the areas that I've decided to go with no mow. And for me, it's a happy medium. And I think that's the key thing, like everything in the garden, it's all about getting the balance right for the garden, but also for you. Some people have asked me what I would advise about whether to do it or not. Well, it's going to be a really personal decision for you, but what I would say is that going with no mow really comes with some really big caveats. The first thing is make sure to really know and understand the scale of your garden. It is so easy to, well, almost have, you know that typical thing of your eyes are bigger than your stomach? Looking out at your garden and thinking, I can do this massive area of no mow. Yes, you can, but you also need to be prepared that you're gonna have to rein it back in later. So choose some no mow, but to a size that you know you're gonna be able to manage really easily. Also, you need to make sure that you've got the suitable tools when you get to the time of year to deal with it. That's something that's worth planning ahead, particularly if you don't own them. You're either gonna to need to buy them or you're gonna to need to think about hiring them. I think also you need to be quite a relaxed person about how your garden looks because if you haven't done the no mow thing before it's going to be a little bit of a lottery about what comes up but that's all part of the fun and if you're willing to do the harder work towards the back end of the summer and you're not too worried about having grass that's going to look perfect once you've cut it down it's definitely worth giving a go but before you do it, I think it is really worth just considering the pros and cons that I've gone through so far and deciding, is this really what I want to do? I'm really glad that I tried it for a year. 
it brought me so many happy moments. What I would say is it also brought me some really unhappy moments. And having tried it for a year, I know what's going to be possible for me and what's going to work. And getting that happy balance, like everything in gardening, is just a really good thing to get. So I really hope that you find this video useful and that it's been interesting, but most of all what I hope is that it gives you a really rounded, comprehensive viewpoint on what it's actually like to live with a proper NOMO setup for a significant period of time. I'm really glad that I tried it. I think if you go for it, you'll be glad you tried it, but just go into it with your eyes open, knowing the pros and the cons. Now, as ever, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell icon because you don't want to miss out on a future episode. And until next time, see you later.